in Akira Kurosawa's 1954 classic Seven Samurai. A group of seven ronin or rogue samurai are brought together and recruited to save a village from invading bandits. Nearly 60 years later, the Japanese town of Okuma was at the center of not only an earthquake and a tsunami, but also the worst nuclear accident since Chernobyl. Just like the villagers in the movie, the town needed immediate protection and support if they wanted to survive a horrific fate, and they found it in a disparate group of engineers and emergency workers who, like the Ronin, banded together to defend against an even greater threat. Welcome to the epic, tragic, and heroic tale of Fukushima 50, the modern-day nuclear samurai. In case you haven't already watched our video breaking down the events of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster, we'll start off with a brief recap. It was by far one of the greatest nuclear disasters in history. On Friday, the 11th of March 2011, a 9 magnitude earthquake shook the seafloor off the coast of Japan. Roughly 43 miles or 70 kilometers east of the Tohoku region of Honshu, Japan's main island. The Tohoku earthquake was the fourth strongest ever recorded, strong enough to shift the coastline of Honshu Island 8 feet to the east, shift the Earth's axis by approximately 4 to 10 inches, and trigger tsunami waves that may have reached heights of up to 40 meters. To the people on the ground, it seemed like the end of days, but things were about to get so much worse. Situated right in the path of the earthquake and resulting waves was the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, located in the town of Okuma, Fukushima Prefecture. While the plant was built to withstand both earthquakes and tsunamis, the force of the Tohoku earthquake far exceeded the seismic tolerance of the reactors, and the plant's 6-meter seawall was unable to stop the 13-meter wave that ended up hitting the plant during the tsunami. As a result, after the plant's main generators had been shut down in automatic response to the earthquake, flooding meant that the backup generators were unable to start up and pick up the slack. This resulted in core meltdowns in the Fukushima's first, second, and third reactors, as the coolant systems in those reactors were no longer receiving the power they needed to function. The plant was in full nuclear meltdown. Initially, the plant's parent company, TEPCO, proposed a complete withdrawal of all staff from the plant, but this proposal was rejected by the Prime Minister, and TEPCO was instructed to direct all of their manpower toward reconnecting the plant to the power grid and stopping any further core meltdowns. However, someone would have to stay inside the radioactive plant and continue to operate it until the repairs were made, or else there could be yet another nuclear meltdown. Enter the Fukushima 50. Despite the name, the actual number of people involved in the operation rotated frequently. At one point on the 18th of March, the number of team members rose to almost 580. Regardless of the real numbers, the media ran with the initial number of 50, using it as a reflection of the solitary nature of the role. The Fukushima 50 were a dedicated team comprised of plant workers, engineers from TEPCO subsidiaries as well as companies like Hitachi and Toshiba, firefighters from nearby cities, and soldiers from the Japanese military. Engineers and soldiers were tasked with cleanup and equipment maintenance, while firefighters were in charge of using seawater to manually cool the damaged reactors. While many of the Fukushima 50 have remained anonymous, one Fukushima employee, Atsufumi Yoshizawa, has come forward to tell his story in the years since giving us a rare insight into what it was like working on the plant in the months after the disaster. Even more harrowing, though, is his experience on that fateful day when one of the world's largest nuclear disasters unfolded right before his very eyes. 54-year-old Yoshizawa was just about to end his shift working as a nuclear engineer at the Fukushima plant when the earthquake hit. He recalls sheltering under a desk as soon as the tremor started and being able to see cars on the street outside bouncing up and down through a nearby window. According to him, it was like no earthquake he'd ever felt before. There were 6,000 workers on site that day, and a third of them, including Yoshizawa, were working in the restricted area nearest to the reactors. When the quake hit, Yoshizawa's thoughts were not with his wife and daughters, who were at the time safely living in the town of Yokohama, south of Tokyo, but with his co-workers, many of whom had moved their families to Okuma and other towns closer to the plant. Once the quake subsided, Yoshizawa joined other senior staff members in an earthquake-proof room to discuss the next steps. Everything looked fine despite the earthquake damage until the tsunami hit. Waves rocked the Fukushima plant, smashing into the seawalls and easily cresting them, only to come crashing down onto the nuclear facility itself. The building rocked once more, not with the power of the earth this time, but with the power of an angry sea. Shortly after the massive 13-meter waves hit the facility, Yoshizawa and his group, taking refuge in an earthquake-proof room, received dreadful news. The power to the cooling systems of the mighty nuclear reactors had been knocked offline. Even worse news, the backup generators had been flooded. Even now, the cores of the nuclear reactors were beginning to melt down, and there was no way to stop it. 
Luckily, the two reactors under Yoshizawa's supervision were reactors 5 and 6, which had avoided serious damage due to already having been put into cold shutdown for routine maintenance. But Yoshizawa knew the longer the power was off, the more likely it would be that the fuel rods in those reactors would melt through the containment like the rods in reactors 1, 2, and 3 had done. For this reason, Yoshizawa volunteered to stay behind while the majority of the plant's employees were evacuated. Yoshizawa would sacrifice his life if necessary to save as many people as possible. I never thought of leaving, Yoshizawa said in an interview. We knew that we would not be replaced. No one was forced to stay, but those of us who remained knew that we would be there until the end. We knew that we were the only people capable of saving the plant. And saving the plant proved to be an incredibly deadly and dangerous job for everyone involved. Due to the amount of radiation as well as flood and earthquake damage, the workers who volunteered to stay behind had to make a temporary home base in a two-story earthquake-resistant building that had been constructed at the center of the complex around a year earlier. The combined amount of space for the workers was about the size of an average living room, and the workers needed to sleep in shifts to ensure the plant could be maintained 24 hours a day. On the 28th of March, an article was published in a Japanese newspaper that detailed this sample routine of a Fukushima 50, giving us a clear idea of what it was like to live and work in the destroyed plant. If you were one of the Fukushima 50, you would be expected to wake up every day at 6 a.m. before attending a meeting that lasted from 7 until 8. Between 8 and 10, you would receive breakfast rations that consisted of 30 cookies and a bottle of vegetable juice. Then, at 10 a.m., you would be sent down to the reactor to begin your maintenance tasks. You wouldn't be given another break until 5 p.m., when you would receive canned food and pre-packed boiled rice for dinner. Then, from 8 until 10, there would be another meeting after which you would retire to your blanket on the floor and let the night shift workers get on with their own schedule. It sounds like a grueling experience and makes even the worst overnight school trips look like a walk in the park. But as Yoshizawa said, nobody was thinking about leaving or slacking off because they knew that if they left the plant unattended, they would spell certain doom for thousands of people in the surrounding areas. But despite most of the hazards having been contained, the plant was still a deadly place to work, and a fresh nuclear disaster was only one accident away. As the workers tried to mitigate the damage in the days that followed, the hydrogen gas being released by overheating zirconium cladding in the reactor cores mixed with oxygen seeping in from the outside a combination that would lead to a series of hydrogen explosions. Reactor 4, which hadn't been damaged in the initial quake, was partially collapsed as a result of a hydrogen explosion in Reactor 3. In total, 16 people were injured in the explosions. During this period, Yoshizawa had briefly relocated to a disaster response center about 5 kilometers away from the plant. However, once the explosion started, Yoshizawa and the other TEPCO employees who had been relocated knew they had no choice but to return to Fukushima. Had the reactors been breached? Was the site dead? Deadly radioactive now? There was no way to know, and yet the Fukushima 50 had a job to do. Shortly after the explosions, the number of emergency personnel stationed in and around the plant had increased dramatically, and as the TEPCO employees made their way back to the plant, they were given a hero's welcome and saluted by lines of soldiers who had also been brought in to support the disaster relief effort. Adding to the danger of the situation was the fact that the team quickly started to run low on supplies. Both food reserves and stores of protective equipment had been severely damaged by the tsunami, and with the Army and Fire Service fully occupied and both assisting in plant maintenance and searching for survivors from the earthquake, supply runs in and out of the area were few and far between. And if that wasn't bad enough, some of the food that they did have that hadn't been irradiated or destroyed by the concurrent natural disasters was inedible due to the lack of either clean water or power to cook with. Each worker at the plant was given a 500 milliliter bottle of clean drinking water that they were only given a chance to refill every two days, so a pot of instant noodles or even a cup of hot coffee was completely out of the question. It wasn't until December of 2011 that power was restored to the plant, enabling all of the reactors to stabilize and enter cold shutdown. Only then were working conditions at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant able to return to anything resembling normal. Unlike the Chernobyl suicide squad who we've talked about before, we don't know the names of most of the so-called Fukushima 50. TEPCO rejects most requests for interviews and most of the information we have about them comes from anonymous sources. You might be curious why these people refused to take credit for saving Japan from an even worse nuclear disaster. Perhaps it was out of a sense of… shame. Shortly after the disaster at Fukushima happened, reports surfaced that proposals to increase the height of the plant's seawall had been repeatedly rejected by the TEPCO higher-ups, once in 2000 and then again in 2008. The entire disaster could have been avoided or at least greatly minimized except for the greed of TEPCO executives who didn't want to pay for a higher seawall. 
In 2012, the government appointed Fukushima Nuclear Accident Independent Investigation Commission declared the accident to have been man-made and a direct result of poor safety assessment on the part of TEPCO. The Fukushima disaster is viewed by many Japanese people as something that could have been completely prevented, and because of that, there's a lot of resentment toward TEPCO among the general population. As a result of this, many who were working at Fukushima at the time want to distance themselves as much as they can from the company that, as far as a lot of people are concerned, is directly responsible for the second largest nuclear disaster in human history. Many of the Fukushima 50, even those who were never TEPCO employees in the first place, fear that going public about their involvement with the plant will hurt their personal reputations. But regardless of who caused the disaster in the first place, without the Fukushima 50, it could have been so much worse. While the death toll of the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami is believed to be as high as 20,000, the number of deaths associated with the plant disaster is only estimated at around 1,368. The vast majority of those deaths can be chalked up to poor handling of the evacuation process, especially in regards to moving elderly and sick residents away from irradiated hospitals and care homes. Despite the fact that Fukushima is listed as a Class 7 nuclear disaster, the highest rating that can be given, the World Health Organization reported in 2013 that the amounts of radiation released into the atmosphere were only a tenth of those of Chernobyl, and so far there have been negligible health effects on the Japanese population that were directly caused by radiation exposure. Although most of the Fukushima plant workers are now at a higher risk of developing cancer later in life, that risk is much higher for the Fukushima 50 and one worker involved in plant maintenance after the disaster did die of radiation-induced lung cancer in 2018. Although these are grim numbers, this is a far better outcome than what could have been. Had the government approved TEPCO's initial proposal to abandon the Fukushima plant completely as soon as the first reactor meltdown occurred, the amount of radiation released from the plant would have been devastating. On top of the number of people displaced by the tsunami and the earthquake, the entire north half of Honshu Island would have been evacuated and the radiation potentially could have spread as far south as Tokyo. As we probably don't need to tell you, relocating that many people in a nation of 130 million, where there were only about 14,000 square miles of land to work with before half of it got irradiated, would be no easy task. This is to say nothing of the death toll, which would have been much higher if the radiation levels had increased. Surprisingly, though the town of Okuma is still uninhabitable, the Fukushima plant is still running. There are no clear plans to decommission the plant, and management estimates that the process would take around 30 to 40 years. Although we don't know most of their names, and there were a lot more than 50 of them, the Fukushima 50 have become a powerful international symbol in the years since the accident. Like the legendary Ronin of the Middle Ages, some people loved the Fukushima 50 as heroes for their sacrifice, while others still see them as villains because of their complicity in TEPCO's negligent safety practices. But regardless of how the public views them, there's no doubt that the Fukushima 50 saved Japan from what would have been a truly apocalyptic nuclear disaster. And much like Kurosawa's Seven Samurai, those who spent 2011 working tirelessly to restore order in the nuclear chaos have formed a unique bond through their ordeal. Looking back on the experience, Yoshizawa likens the camaraderie of the Fukushima 50 to that of soldiers during wartime, simply saying, the enemy was a nuclear power plant and we fought it together. Now go watch how Fukushima disaster actually happened, or if you want to learn about another group of nuclear heroes, check out the Chernobyl Suicide Squad, three men who prevented even worse nuclear disaster.